Welcome to the second season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Edmonton in Alberta, Canada, is a large oil and gas city with a million and a half people. And one of those people was Mark Twitchell. Born in 1949, he grew up dreaming of becoming a successful movie maker and completed a radio and television art program at college. Over time, he came to think of himself as a psychopath. While he admittedly didn't exhibit all the characteristics... He was a self-confessed pathological liar to everyone around him. Friends, family, it didn't matter who. Sometimes he would think up a lie on the spot. Other times, he would go to great lengths to carry it out. Set up a bogus email address, forge documents, or hire an actor to deceive his wife, a woman whom he just had a daughter with. He felt his wife was a great woman, but it didn't stop him from cheating on her. She had her suspicions, and the couple entered counseling, and she assisted he see a psychiatrist every Friday. The couple slept in different rooms, her in the bedroom, he in the basement. It gave him the space he needed to become the dark person he so desperately wanted to be. She had glimpses into the real Mark, his lack of empathy, his non-existent work habit. He was often fired or quit and didn't tell her. Instead, he pretended to get up every day and go to work. But in reality, he took his beaten up old laptop covered in stickers and sat in coffee shops writing a movie. Mark was fascinated by all things related to television and movies, and in particular, the fictional character of a vigilante serial killer, Dexter Morgan, on the TV show Dexter. He spent countless hours creating costumes, including the Star Wars characters he used in his 2007 fan film named Star Wars Secrets of the Rebellion, a film that was never released. A year later in 2008, he managed to get financial backing for a movie he had written titled House of Cards, in which a cheating husband is lured to a remote location for a date that he made on the internet. Then he is murdered. On his laptop, he wrote a document called The Profile of a Psychopath, seven pages detailing how he fit the profile. In it, he wrote, and I quote, My whole life, I've always done whatever the hell I wanted without any consideration for anyone else, and it's never bothered me. I don't experience things like remorse or guilt, and for as long as I can remember, I have always had a distinct lack of empathy. I've always had a dark side I've had to sugarcoat for the world. He went on to say that he fantasized about killing people who had wronged him, but didn't feel killing someone was worth the loss of his freedom. Rather than the flash of adrenaline from a murder, he would rather incorporate his dark side into his work with a thriller movie, where he would profit from its sale and distribution. But somewhere along the way, he changed his mind. He wanted it all. Murder, fame, and money. Mark wrote a biography of sorts on his laptop titled SK Confessions. The opening line stated, This story is based on true events. The names and events were altered slightly to protect the guilty. This is the story of my progression into becoming a serial killer. In it, he discussed his new hobby and the type of victim he would target. 
He decided that a married man wouldn't work because his wife would report him missing too quickly. So he aimed for a middle-aged single man who lived alone so that afterwards he could burglarize his home. Mark downloaded an IP blocker, set up a fake email account, and created a profile of a woman on a dating site. Then he made a shopping list of all the items he would need, but first he had to find a location. He rented a detached two-car garage in a residential neighborhood south of the city. The access was down a narrow paved back lane. Although bordered by houses, it was surrounded by high fences and private. He removed the address from the garage, blocked out the windows, and changed the locks. He went shopping, making sure to go to several stores to avoid suspicion, and paid with cash. He bought a stun baton, dark hoodie, goalie mask, several rolls of plastic sheets, duct tape, heavy-duty plastic bags, and disposable overalls. He picked up a hunter's kit for processing game meat. For the kill knife, he went to a military surplus store and chose a hunting knife with an 8-inch blade. And just like Dexter, he built a sturdy 4-foot by 6-foot table with a stainless steel top. But he didn't have a boat or the ocean to dispose of the body, so he chose to incinerate it and ordered a 45-gallon steel barrel. He scoured the responses to his dating profile for his desired target. A man between 5'7 and 5'11, weighing between 150 and 180 pounds. Size was important. It had to be someone he could manage. He found his target in Gilles Tetro and set up a date. He asked Gilles to pick him up and provided directions to the garage. Mimicking Dexter, he turned the garage into a kill room, taped plastic sheets together and draped them over the table, and hung a dark green cloth from the ceiling that he could hide behind. He put on the goalie mask that he'd painted black with three gold vertical stripes that resembled knife blades, pulled the hoodie over his head, slid the holster with the knife onto his belt, and put on leather gloves. Ready for his victim, he hid behind the green cloth and waited. Gilles pulled up to the garage door, turned off the engine, and his car's headlights went dark. He entered the garage, and Mark wasted no time in pressing the stun gun baton into the back of his neck. But it didn't work the way that he thought it would. Gilles was strong and fought back. Mark punched him several times in the head, but he stood his ground. Gilles broke free and was about to run for the door when Mark pulled out a gun. He pointed it at Gilles and his eyes went wide. Mark ordered him to the floor. He removed his gloves, grabbed the roll of duct tape and covered his eyes. But Gilles decided he had to fight. If he was going to die... It was going to be his way. He ripped off the duct tape and got to his feet. He saw the gun and grabbed it, then realized it wasn't real. The two exchanged blows and Mark had butted him. Shields managed to break free and ran out the door into the driveway. But Shields' legs failed him and he dropped to the ground. Mark knew what he had to do. He grabbed one of his legs and began pulling. Gilles dug deep and fought back and managed to break free. There in the alley was a couple out for an evening walk. Gilles yelled for help. They didn't want to get involved, but their presence was enough. Mark turned and slunk back into the garage. Mark emailed him a warning telling him he traced his IP address, and if he tried to report him to police, he would hunt him down and finish him off. Gilles stayed quiet. 
Mark let off a little steam by meeting up with his ex-girlfriend. All the while, he was planning his next move. He bought two galvanized steel pipes and wrapped hockey tape around one end to give him a secure grip. He created a new fake email account and a new dating profile and began trolling for his next victim. He liked one of the responses. They flirted back and forth until a date was set for Friday, October 10th. Mark provided Johnny Altinger with directions to the garage. Before leaving his home that night, Johnny texted those directions to two of his friends. Mark's SK confessions detailed how his kill room was set up. This time, he opted not to use a stun baton. Just before 7 p.m., he put on the goalie mask and hoodie. His adrenaline was pumping. He turned the lights down low and hid behind the curtain and waited. He heard Johnny's red Mazda approaching. The engine stopped. The car door opened. Johnny crawled under the garage door that was slightly ajar, stood up and called out, Hello! Mark wasn't expecting that. Instead of pouncing the dark like he'd planned, he turned on the light switch and announced he was a filmmaker preparing a set for a serial killer movie. He became super friendly and showed him his props. But then he got cold feet and told Johnny that his date was running late and would be there in about 20 minutes. Johnny left and said he'd come back. Now I know what you're all thinking. Johnny should have ran and never looked back. But he returned in 20 minutes. Mark chickened out again and said she wasn't going to be able to make it. Johnny turned around and left for the second time. Mark went back to the messages on his computer and started scrolling for his next victim. He was going through them when Johnny sent him a message. Mark immediately replied and offered to reschedule for the next day. But Johnny didn't want to wait and suggested he return that night. Mark sat and stared at the computer screen for a full 30 minutes. Then he invited him over. This time, Mark didn't wear his mask. Johnny walked into the garage, and the pipe came crashing down on his skull. He began screaming. That only fueled Mark. He brought the pipe down again, and blood splattered. Johnny dropped to the floor, still conscious. He begged for Mark to stop hitting him and tried to grab the pipe. Mark reached for the hunting knife and raised it. Johnny's eyes grew wide. Mark thrust the knife into his stomach, then his neck. Blood seeped out into a pool on the floor. Johnny died at 38. Mark stood over his body with a bloody pipe in one hand and watched the life leave his body. Now this is where Mark got sloppy and deviated from his hero, Dexter. He didn't lay plastic on the floor, and now he couldn't risk moving the body. Mark stood still. He waited, his ears burning to see if he could hear sirens. There were none. He hoisted Johnny up onto the table, reached into his pockets, removed his wallet and keys, and set them aside. Starting at his feet, he cut off his clothes. He retrieved the hunting kit and began processing his kill and placed the parts in plastic bags. Mark took down the plastic walls, then began to roll up the plastic from the table when he noticed it hadn't done much to keep it clean. Next time, he'd double layer it. Then he got the ammonia and paper towel and mopped up the blood. With the garage cleaned up, he realized that he was covered in blood from head to toe. 
He has spare clothes in his car, but what about his face? How would he clean the blood off? As he was pondering that, his phone vibrated. It was his wife. He hesitated for a second, then answered it. She wanted him to pick up some baby formula on the way home and mentioned she was heading to bed. Mark replied that he would, but he had no intention of shopping. He parked on his car inside, found his cell phone, and turned it off. He raced home, went straight to the dark basement, threw his clothes into the washer, and hopped into the shower. The next morning, he told his wife that the store had been out of formula, and he spent the day hanging out with his family. Sunday morning, Mark woke up at 5 a.m. and drove to Johnny's apartment building. He pulled his hoodie over his head and wore gloves. He looked around for surveillance cameras, and not seeing any, used his keys to let himself in. He went to his computer and saw that his accounts were set up for auto-login, so he set up an auto-reply on his email to say that he'd gone away with a woman for an extended vacation and updated his Facebook status to say the same. He moved Johnny's car to a friend's house, returned home, and spent the day with his family. Monday morning, he got up early, pretending he was going to work but instead had plans to go to his parents' house, knowing that they would be out for the day. First, he drove to the garage, lined his trunk with plastic, and placed the body bags inside, and laid the steel barrel across the back seat. At his parents, he set the barrel down in their secluded backyard, and dropped a plastic bag inside, poured gasoline, and lit it. Flames flew up and smoke filled the air. But it wasn't having the desired effect. Then he heard sirens. He put out the fire and waited. The sirens stopped. He put the bags back into his car and drove them back to the garage. A couple days later, he decided to cut the body into small pieces and dispose of it in the river. He returned to the garage. This time, he spread plastic sheeting on the floor and table and used it to make an apron for himself and put grocery bags on his shoes. Then he got to work. It took all day, longer than he expected, so he returned home that night to get a good night's sleep. He woke up at 5 a.m., drove to the river, but discovered there wasn't a discreet place to pull off the road. Then it hit him. The city sewer. What a perfect place to hide a body. He drove to an older suburb on the east side of town, one with back alleys. There he found what he was looking for. Daylight had broken, but he didn't see a soul. He lifted the heavy grate and one by one cut the bags open and dropped their contents into the water below. He returned to the garage and placed a steel barrel in the driveway and over the next few hours burned the evidence. He opened his laptop and deleted the SK confessions and profile of a psychopath. Meanwhile, when Johnny's friends saw his vacation notice, they knew something was wrong and contacted the Edmonton police and provided them with the address. Police soon found out that Mark had rented the garage and questioned him. He pretended he didn't know anything, that is, until he offered up an unusual story. He claimed he bought a red mouse to off a stranger for 40 bucks, Now police knew they were looking for Johnny's red Mazda. Was this a coincidence? Likely not. In their investigation, they discovered Mark was a fan of the TV show Dexter, and they quickly confiscated his car. CBC News reported that they found a knife and sheath with blood, and in the trunk, 
they found his laptop. Ten days after the murder, police arrived at Mark's house with a warrant and told his wife they suspected him of murder. Their search turned up the goalie mask in the basement and clothes with blood stains. In the garage, they discovered the barrel and a bottle of ammonia. When crime scene technicians sprayed luminol in the search for blood, the floor lit up. Computer experts uncovered the deleted documents on Mark's laptop, and police asked the first victim to come forward. Jill's did and they discovered that his account of what happened matched almost word for word with Mark's SK confessions. Mark was now under 24-hour police surveillance. The Calgary Herald reported that forensic technicians found blood in his car and yellow post-it notes with phrases to destroy wallet contents and kill room clean sweep. Fittingly, it was Halloween when Mark was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. A year and a half later, he summoned police to the Edmonton Remand Center, where he was being held for trial. He slid a folded piece of paper across the table. When officers opened it, they saw a Google map, and below, Mark had written, Location of John Altinger's Remains. Mark went on trial in April 2011. He admitted to luring Gilles to the garage, then Johnny a week later, and murdering him. But he said it had been in self-defense. He claimed his SK confessions was a novel, and partly fiction, and that the events in the garage had been a publicity stunt. But the jury didn't buy it, and it took them only five hours to find him guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. Outside the courtroom, homicide detective Bill Clark told the Edmonton Journal, We caught him on his first one, so he's a very poor serial killer, and thankfully he will never become a serial killer. In her victim impact statement, Johnny's mother said she still calls her son's cell phone, just to hear his voice. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Chelsea Brooke. She grew up in a small town, loved parties, and spent weeks making her Halloween costume. Among the thousand party goers, Chelsea and her friends got separated. Without a ride, she started walking. Chelsea never made it home. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. To support Murder in 20, please like and share, and feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them, we're not shy. Until next week, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.